What's up, everybody? I'm the Goju Ryu Philosopher, and, well, this video has been coming for quite some time. Personally speaking, I am not a big fan of the World Karate Federation's Kumite rule set. While a lot of karateka enjoy the competitive scene and find it to be incredibly engaging, I think that most of us understand that the style of point fighting in competitive kumite is all told not that great for actually producing fighters. I'm sure that there is someone out there who does legitimately think that they're learning how to fight every time they step on the mat, but most people recognize that because of the number of rules and restrictions that go into kumite, it is almost nothing like a real fight. This holds true whether you're comparing it against competitive fighters in MMA, or just against security camera videos of people beating the tar out of each other at gas stations. Point sparring just isn't good for practicing fighting techniques, and even more so than kata, which some people also think isn't good for practicing techniques, point sparring can actually develop certain bad habits, such as flinching anytime someone faints at you, or hitting a single strike and then not following up because you're used to a ref immediately stopping you to reset. This video isn't actually going to be about all that, but I did want to acknowledge it here at the outset. The WKF's kata competition rules are also a little strange to me, but a lot of that strangeness actually makes sense when you think about it. It is difficult to judge someone's understanding of a kata and its techniques without both being familiar enough with that kata yourself, or without getting up close and personal with the practitioner and having them demonstrate their understanding of those techniques on you. But that sort of format would take absolutely forever, and it would still be incredibly difficult to judge whether one practitioner was better than another. It would also run into the problem that there are, in effect, just too many kata. In order to really judge the essence of someone's kata, you'd have to know how they were supposed to have performed it compared to how they actually did, and given how many kata are out there, with more being invented every year, it's simply impossible for any one judge to know and memorize all of them and analyze their ins and outs. The current WKF rules limit the kata that can be performed to a list of 102, although quite a few of these are different spellings for the same name of a kata. Realistically, though, most judges probably aren't intimately familiar with all of those kata, not to mention the fact that many styles perform the same kata under the same name, but with certain slight variations. But you would think that fighting, at least, would be a different situation. It should be relatively simple to tell who's won a fight, and it shouldn't matter what style they used to do it. And, well, the current WKF Kumite rule set, for all its various flaws, is at the very least much easier to judge than the more subjective parts of kata competition. The WKF's point system is a lot more logical than the 10-point must system used by a lot of combat sports to determine match winners when neither competitor scores a knockout or a submission. And sure, it might not produce competent fighters, but the goal of the rule set was just to be an enjoyable competitive sport that ensures the safety of its athletes. After all, there's nothing limiting you to only do WKF sparring, even if a depressing number of dojos do in fact do just that. However, I do think that there's one major problem with the WKF's rule set that really can't be overlooked, and that is that it doesn't make sense as a rule set for karate. Without further ado, let's get into it. Karate prior to the 1920s did not have a fixed rule set for sparring. In fact, the idea of karate competitions was, at the time, quite foreign to everybody who practiced. That's not to say that karateka didn't pressure test their styles or engage in more free fighting. They did quite often, in fact. Motobu Choki engaged in kake dameshi, seeking out street fights in order to test his fighting ability and to hone his technique. Higaona Kanryo's students, Miyagi Chojun and Kyoda Juhatsu, sparred each other quite frequently, and also fought against people from other styles or backgrounds, usually in a friendly manner, of course. In fact, it used to be quite common for ambitious young fighters to seek out and challenge people who were famous for their combative skill, hoping to gain some fame or perhaps notoriety in one go by beating an already established martial artist. And that's not even getting into the various indigenous grappling contests, such as tegumi or sumo, which were played as games between youth all across the various islands. However, there were no particular sets of rules that these fights followed, and also, if anything, fights between karateka were the exception, not the rule. Most of the time, these challenges weren't even events, but rather just situations where one fighter would challenge another in some way, often with a specific goal in mind, like 
escape from my firm grip, or try to land a solid punch and I'll only block and dodge. The first big formal fights came about after Commodore Matthew Perry brought Americans to Ryukyu and Japan, and after a while, once these countries were opened, American, and occasionally French, British, Russian, soldiers would participate in exhibition matches with local Japanese martial artists. These exhibitions, called Medikan after a corrupted pronunciation of the word American, took place under event-specific rules and usually tended to disadvantage the Japanese fighters, who were often shorter, lighter, and in no position to demand that the organizers allow them to use their own techniques. Famously, Motobu Choki participated in one of these matches, where he defeated a Russian boxer with a very strong punch to the head. But a few sporadic exhibitions does not a competitive rule set make, and even if one had come about, since the majority of Japanese martial artists in these Merikan matches were judoka or otherwise representatives of mainland fighting styles, it would not have benefited karateka. Now there were a few practices within Okinawa that could have served as an effective basis for a sparring rule set, such as the freeform practice of the Motobu brothers, or the Goju-ryu practice of Irikumi. In fact, Irikumi is a very interesting example because you will still occasionally see it sometimes, and I think that it deserves to be much more well known than it currently is. In this practice, an advanced karateka is paired off with a less experienced student who is told to attack his senior. The senior karateka is not permitted to strike or kick back, but instead has to use sweeps, blocking and avoiding, joint lock techniques, or just proper timing in order to get in and shove his younger attacker to the ground, or to otherwise indicate that he has successfully defeated him. The terms irikumi and irikumi go, as well as occasionally irikumi ju, are still in use by certain goju ryu organizations to this day, although nowadays they generally denote something more akin to kyokushin sparring, but with some more protectors and face punches allowed. However, although there were many situations, such as the famous Ryukyu Shinpo Zadankai, where various karateka tried to standardize their efforts to promote karate to Japan and then to the world, the influence of the Second World War largely kept them from being able to make much headway, and no real competitive rule set was established, at least by the Okinawan senses. After the conclusion of the war, of course, Okinawa and the mainland were separated from each other, with the former governed by the US civil administration of the Ryukyus, and the latter by General MacArthur, the supreme commander of the Allied Powers. During MacArthur's tenure as the de facto leader of Japan, his policy was to completely demilitarize Japan, and as part of this, his office instituted a ban on almost all Budo activities, since they had been used to inculcate a martial spirit in some of Japan's young men. This ban did extend to karate in the opinion of the Ministry of Education, even though MacArthur never specifically singled our style out. During the same period on Okinawa, most of the karateka left were focused less on teaching martial arts and more on rebuilding their homes and livelihoods after a battle which claimed the lives of as many as one out of every three civilians on Okinawa. It took a while for karate practice to begin again, both in Okinawa and the mainland, but the SCAP would pull out of Japan in 1952, whereas USCAR would stay in Okinawa for two more decades. The same year as the US pulled out of directly controlling the Japanese government, many styles of Japanese martial arts came together to form the International Martial Arts Federation, also known as the Kokusai Budoin. This organization primarily existed to give out ranks to its various members. For comparison, Miyagi Chojun Sensei never awarded black belts or dan ranks, which he felt couldn't be awarded except on the authority of the imperial family, much like how he was given the title of Kyoshi by the Dainippon Butoku Kai. The only students of his who received dan ranks prior to his passing were those who were similarly honored by the Butoku Kai, and the man himself was only posthumously awarded his 10th dan. Nevertheless, on the mainland, as a founding member of the IMAF, Yamaguchi Gogen was recognized by the mainland martial arts community as a 10th dan black belt. Thereafter, this organization began to build an identity for karate on the mainland, at a time where Okinawans were still by and large unable to travel to that same mainland. During the 20 years between the IMAF's founding and the withdrawal of USCAR, Japanese mainland karate developed along a completely different path than Okinawan karate. And as luck would have it, it was during this time that organizations like the JKF started to standardize their visions of what kumite rule sets should look like. This is the beginning of when point sparring started to take hold, 
And although there were certain organizations, like the Kyokushinkai, who rejected this style of kumite in favor of more full contact fighting, these point sparring styles would become the dominant force from there on out. In 1970, the World Union of Karate Do Organizations was formed, with its own set of guidelines for competitive sparring, and by 1985 it would become recognized by the International Olympic Committee as the governing body for sport karate, effectively solidifying point sparring's position as the dominant form of kumite. The WUKO was, of course, the forerunner of the WKF that we know today. Because mainland Japanese karate was effectively isolated from Okinawan karate for about two decades, the development of kumite rule sets was largely done by Japanese karateka, and they brought certain unique features of other Japanese martial arts to their growing rule set. The primary way that karate began its spread on the mainland was by the founding of karate clubs at various universities, and these university karateka were often of quite different opinions on how best to practice than their senseis. These young karateka didn't really appreciate the somewhat slow and structured ways that they were often taught, and so they would occasionally host their own free sparring competitions outside of the view of their teachers. It was pretty common for these students to have some background in judo, or especially in kendo, which already had a standardized competitive rule set for free fighting, and so many of these young karateka drew on their kendo experience when figuring out how to organize these matches. Kendo competitions focus on the first valid touch rule to determine who the winner is. Whatever various techniques that existed within the kenjutsu styles that were collected into kendo's background, the valid scoring areas have been limited to the head, body, and arms, and these are all areas where a valid strike would, if fighting with real blades, result in either the death or incapacitation of the opponent. The karate kumite developed by these college students also began to form a first valid touch rule, based on the idea of ikken hisatsu, a single strike that ended the fight. I've already mentioned in my video on Zanshin that karate strikes are much less likely to finish a fight in a single blow than a single cut from a nihonto. But the influence that this first valid touch mentality had on karateka was that it encouraged them to work on getting their strike in faster than their opponent, even if only by a fraction of a second. This meant that a lot of karateka stopped focusing on guarding or blocking or even dodging their opponent's strikes. A lot of the close-range techniques as well, including elbows and knees, deflections followed by body shots, and of course the various takedowns such as deashi barai, were incredibly disincentivized by this rule set, since they made it that much more likely that your opponent would strike you before you could pull them off. And of course, before protective gear was standardized, this made the whole kumite process a lot more dangerous. Even at the time, karateka were expected to pull their punches, using sundome to ensure that they didn't injure their opponent. The problem is, sundome requires a degree of pulling back that slows the strike ever so much in what could be the decisive instant of the match. Therefore, it was pretty common for competitors to get just that little bit more speed out of their punches by letting go of their control, occasionally wailing on their opponent to a disturbing degree. Karate point sparring, and WKF Kumite specifically, is a direct outgrowth of these college competitions, meaning that it is a direct outgrowth of kendo competitions in a sense. The idea of first valid touch was maintained, and the acceptable targets, such as in kendo, were limited to the head and body mostly. Also taking cues from kendo, they've now established a set of protectors to limit the amount of injury that takes place, which is especially useful for maintaining sundome, since the padded gloves now have over an inch of give before actually letting your fist strike an opponent, leading to much less actual contact. Furthermore, splitting the scoring techniques into yuko, wazari, and ippon has allowed the WKF format to further incentivize high-risk, high-reward techniques like deashi barai, especially since now matches aren't decided by the first person to score an ippon, but rather by the sum of all the techniques scored within a certain time frame. A lot of these changes were done to promote safety and to make it easier to tell who actually won a match. Tamano Toshio-sensei relates the story of a competition that he attended without these rules, where competitors and spectators had disagreed with the judging of a match, and a full-out brawl had broken out. At least the current system allows for a judge to get one ambiguous score wrong, and still not score the match entirely incorrectly. But even with these improvements, a lot of the negative effects of Kumite's origins in kendo competitions still show through. 
I remember once watching a championship kumite match to study how the fighters moved, and noticing quite possibly the most baffling call I have ever seen. One competitor began a kick, but as she turned her hips over, her bottom foot slipped and she fell to the ground. And the other competitor seized on this to shift in and perform a punch to her grounded opponent, exactly as she would have if she had swept her. However, since apparently during her fall she had completed the chudan kick effectively, the grounded competitor was awarded the points, even though the kick wouldn't have been able to connect, and her mistake was immediately capitalized on by her opponent. This is a somewhat extreme but illustrative example about why the first valid touch criterion sometimes leads to bad calls. But even outside of this example, that rule means that WKF Kumite rarely features blocks, knee strikes or elbows, sweeps or takedowns, or really most of the techniques that we actually practice in our kata. Yes, this is my big gripe with WKF Kumite. The way that it's structured means that it's impossible to do most karate techniques in a karate competition. Kata and Kumite are separate branches of competition, but theoretically they're supposed to be part of the same art. Karate. And yet, when you look at the techniques found within either one of them, they almost don't resemble each other at all. WKF Kumite rarely, if ever, shows off the stances, the blocks, the strong elbow strikes, or the various open-handed techniques that are all over kata. And on the other side, I've yet to find a single kata that contains a jodan mawashigeri, despite that being the highest scoring kick in kumite. Even the kamae are completely different. Real briefly, I would like to point out that WKF kumite isn't useless whatsoever. It is a useful and interesting type of training, and it can really help develop a sense of range and distance, a sense of proper timing and execution of techniques, and, in many cases, an understanding of where you need to get better at guarding and moving. I'm also not saying that it should be more full contact. I actually think it's very useful to have a style of sparring that is more light contact, because not everyone is looking to fight or compete, and while a pro might be okay with the risk of CTE, a hobbyist generally isn't going to want to risk a concussion just to play a sport. Unless there's someone cool like, you know, a hockey player. The biggest issue that I have with WKF Kumite is that, for all intents and purposes, it is still the only globally recognized karate competitive format, and yet it completely leaves out the majority of karate's techniques. WKF Kumite is as related to the rest of karate as figure skating is to ice hockey. They have certain skills in common, but most of what each does has really no overlap with the other, and they're basically entirely separate skill sets. And it definitely gets on my nerves when a dojo advertises itself as a place to learn self-defense skills, and then only teaches WKF sparring, but that's really more of an issue of them advertising something that they don't actually provide. I just wish that WKF point sparring wasn't considered representative of karate in general. Now, what would be a better system? Well, heck if I know. I'm just a young karateka with a surprisingly successful small YouTube channel, so I'm in no position to tell anyone how to spar. There are already some interesting examples out there, like Kyokushin and its offshoots, as well as Karate Combat more recently, and of course the Irikumi Go and Irikumi Ju formats that the IOGKF occasionally runs. But the biggest problem with all of those, although Irikumi Ju is the least difficult in this regard, is that they require a level of contact that some hobbyists might not be comfortable with. Tamano Toshio-sensei tried to solve this by devising his own preferred method of sparring, which has the special rule of using three rounds, one where each of the competitors can only defend while the other attacks, and then a final one where they can both freely attack and defend. And of course, outside of competitions, you can always fit your own method of sparring to whatever you might want to try to work on. At the end of the day, it's going to be necessary to, pardon the pun, strike out on your own a little and find out what works for you. And it would be incredibly arrogant of me to try and prescribe my own preferences onto the entire karate world, especially since only about 1600 people would even see my suggestions. At the end of the day though, I just wanted these musings to be out there. It's going to take a lot of thought to come up with a more appropriate competitive rule set, 
And I think that if we get enough minds thinking about how to make karate techniques more of a part of our karate competitions, we might be able to come up with at least a few worthwhile ideas. Much like how the pioneers of karate had to change their practice in order to fit into the ideas of Japanese budo and physical education, us karateka nowadays are at a turning point where our art and its styles of practice and training are being subsumed by MMA. The karate world is going to have to change to fit the new era, and while some dojos have led the way, we need to make sure that the rest of us aren't held back. Or at least come up with something new so we don't get made fun of for basically just playing tag but with punches and kicks. Thank you all so much for listening to me point out problems without offering any solutions. I hope that this video makes you think a bit, because as always, that has been my main goal. Additionally, something that's kind of a side effect of how long it actually took me to film this is that by the time I'm filming, the karate competition in the 2021 Tokyo Olympics has begun to take place. That competition, of course, uses the WKF rule set. So while this wasn't actually planned, I'm hoping to seize on some of the algorithm talking about Olympic karate to try and get more eyes on my work. You all understand, right? Yeah, we good, we good. If you enjoyed this video, then there's a button that you can press to say that, and as always, you can leave me a comment to tell me what you think would be better for a sparring rule set, and why it should be modeled directly after the All Valley Karate Championships. Seriously, I have no idea why they let, like, under-18s do full contact, knockout, bone-breaking kumite. That's, uh, what can I say but yikes. If you're interested in seeing more of my thoughts about karate, subscribe to this channel, turn on notifications, and give me a billion dollars on Patreon if you happen to be a billionaire. And if you just happened to lose a WKF Rules sparring match, share this video with the person who beat you as an excuse for why you lost. I've been the Goju Ryu Philosopher, and yummy! Alright, so that was going to be the end of the video, and it's already like 22 minutes long or something ridiculous like that, but as I sat down to edit it, something happened in the aforementioned Olympics that you might have heard about by this point. In the men's 75 kilogram and up kumite division, the Saudi competitor and the Iranian competitor, whose names I would probably mispronounce and I don't want to embarrass myself, so I'm just going to call them that, were facing off for the gold. The Iranian happened to step in for a punch at the exact moment that the Saudi launched a Jodan Mawashigeri, and he got clocked in the face and was dropped like a sack of potatoes. And then, to the shock of anybody who doesn't know about the WKF's peculiarities, the Iranian, the competitor who had been KO'd, was awarded the match by disqualification. Since then, I've seen a lot of people making fun of Olympic karate for this call, and that makes me incredibly sad because for a lot of people around the world, this is going to be their first and possibly only experience with karate. A lot of people are also comparing it against more full contact fighting systems, where that result would have been a victory for the Saudi competitor, and Karate Combat, the famous foolish contact karate promotion, has offered both competitors a rematch under their rule set. Now, as I said in the video, I do think that it's useful to have a more light contact sparring competition for karate, as, you know, a way of letting hobbyists enjoy the sport. But even under the WKF's own rules, this call does seem a little bit strange, even though it does technically follow the letter of those rules. If the Iranian competitor hadn't happened to step in at the wrong moment, the Saudi's kick would have been a textbook ippon, and he was already winning. Having stepped into my fair share of punches and kicks, I know how quickly a light and controlled strike can turn into a painful blow just with some bad timing. The Iranian competitor also dropped his guard as he went to step in and punch, which is both a bad idea in general, but specifically seems to me like a lapse in his Zanshin, which is the WKF's most nebulous scoring criterion. It would definitely be interesting to see these two do a more full contact match, of course, but the reason I'm including it is because this really controversial finish made a very interesting compliment to the points that I was already planning on making about the level of contact in WKF Kumite. And also because I'm pretty sure that if I had released the video as is, without mentioning it, all of the comments would be, but did you see that Olympic bout though? What do you guys think? How could this match have been done better? And 
what does it say about the way karate is being perceived by the world now that we've had our Olympic debut? Another thing that I didn't record with the original video that I'm recording now is my thank you to my patrons, whose names should be on screen now, and an extra special thanks to Stefan Sandberg. You can join them in the link that should be down below. And see you all in the next video.